I, I do want to start the message today uh, by asking you guys a question. And I want you to just think about this for a couple moments as I ask this question. The question is this. Is there a sin that is so bad, so grievous, so awful, so terrible, that if a person commits this sin, they cannot be forgiven? Think about that for a second. Is there a sin so bad, so bad, so awful, so terrible, that if a person commits this sin, they cannot be forgiven? So if you think, yes, there is a sin like this, raise your hand. Got a few hands. Okay. If you think, no, there is no sin like this, raise your hand. How many of you are thinking, I know Pastor Mike at this point, and I'm not going to commit to anything? <laughs> there we go. I'm going to read to you a verse from uh, Mark's Gospel. There are parallels to this in Matthew and Luke also. This is Mark 3, 28 and 29. Mark 3, 28 and 29. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. So according to this, there is a sin here that's unforgivable, a sin that is eternal, which is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or speaking against the Holy Spirit. But we've got to understand what exactly is that sin? And are any of us in danger of committing that sin? Well, before I get too far into this, let me try to put your minds at ease. If you're here right now listening to this sermon, the chance of you committing that sin is pretty much zero. So I wouldn't worry too much about it for you personally. But let's just look look briefly at the context of what's happening here when Jesus says this. So Jesus is accused by some teachers of the law that say he's driving out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Now, Beelzebul is another name for Satan or another name for the devil. And they're saying that Jesus is driving out demons because he's empowered to do so by the prince of demons. And Jesus says, guys, that's absolutely nuts. How can Satan drive out Satan? Why would Satan drive out Satan? A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan is divided, Satan cannot stand. Essentially, what's happening here is he's saying evil will not drive away evil. There's a really famous uh, Martin Luther King Jr. quote that echoes this sentiment when, when Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Evil cannot and will not drive away evil. Jesus is here, he's performing all these miracles, he's healing the sick, he's giving sight to the blind, and yes, he is driving out demons. And the teachers of the law are accusing him of being able to do this because he's been empowered by Satan to do these things. Now, it'd be really easy, I think, for us to stand there watching Jesus do all these things and saying he's doing it because he's possessed by demons. He's doing this stuff in an evil way. It's some form of witchcraft or some form of magic or something like that. But it's the Holy Spirit that is revealing to people that Jesus is doing these things because he, Jesus, because Jesus is God. So this idea of blasphemies against the Spirit or speaking against the Spirit is rejecting the truth that the Holy Spirit is revealing to someone. It's rejecting the truth that Jesus is God. How does this now apply today? Is this sin as simple as in a moment of doubt a person stops believing that God is real? Is that this sin? That in a moment of doubt one questions whether Jesus is really God? Is that what this sin is? Well, if that's the case, then I personally have committed this unforgivable sin. When I was in high school, I rejected the idea of God for a short time. I didn't believe in God. I was very much an atheist. That lasted, honestly, for maybe a day or so, but I was still there. Does this mean that today I'm not actually forgiven? That I committed that sin that was so bad that I could never be forgiven? That I don't actually know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? That I don't actually have the Holy Spirit living inside of me? If so, why in the world am I telling people they need to accept Jesus as their Savior? If so, why did I pick up my whole life and move to Hiawatha, Kansas? a town where there's not a Taco Bell within 40 miles of us. <laughs> a simple moment of doubt. 
A simple moment of doubt or uncertainty is not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What this sin really is, what I think it really is, at least the best explanation for this sin, is when someone hears the message of the gospel from a believer, the message that salvation is through Christ and through Christ alone. When I or another Christ follower talks to someone about Jesus, and when the Holy Spirit speaks to that person, speaks to their heart, and reveals to them that, yes, this message is true. Jesus really is the only way to the Father. Now, if that person rejects the message, and they reject it, and they reject it, and they reject it, and they reject it, and they continue to reject the truth as the Holy Spirit reveals it to them time and time and time and time again, eventually that person will get to a point where they will not hear that message. They will not have the truth revealed to them. Their heart has become so hardened to where it will never be open to the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. They've committed this sin against the Holy Spirit by calling the Holy Spirit a liar and totally rejecting the truth revealed by the Spirit. For those of us that are Christians, we have a job to do that God has given us to do. The most the most important task for us is to tell others about Jesus. The Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, I thought the most important job was for us to love one another. Well, I would, I would argue that that's the most important trait for a Christian to exhibit. After all, it is the greatest commandment, love God, love people. But our task, our job, the work that we have from that Great Commission is to make disciples. And how do we make disciples? We do that by telling them about Jesus. So the big question comes up for us. If there are people out there that will never hear the message of Jesus and have so soundly rejected the message given to them by the Holy Spirit, is it really our job to tell everyone? How do we separate out those we must tell with those people that have rejected it and that we can skip? Like, I don't have to tell that person about Jesus. How do we know, then, who has committed this eternal sin? The truth is, we can't. We can't possibly know if someone has committed that eternal sin. Only God knows what's honestly in someone's heart. Whether they've so hardened their heart against the truth of Jesus, they will never accept it. Only God knows the answer to that. Meaning we must share the message of salvation through Christ Jesus with absolutely everyone around us. You might think your neighbor that has 666 tattooed across his forehead, you might think he's thoroughly rejected God. But we can't be certain of that. So we share with him what Jesus has done for him. What Jesus has done for us all. And what has Jesus done for all of us? Well, let me tell you. Something I've noticed in my 43 years of life is that people are not good at following rules. Anybody notice that in their lives? We don't like following rules. And when God created humans, we were in paradise with him in the Garden of Eden. And God said to his creation, he said to the humans that were there, go ahead and eat whatever you want is here except for this tree over here. Don't eat from that tree over there. And what did the people do? They ate from that tree over there. And because of that, God had to say to those people, to humans, guys, you have to leave paradise. But God still loved his creation. And God didn't want to be separated from what he created. And even though humans aren't good at following rules, humans needed, humans needed a clear set of rules to follow, to know right from wrong. We're not going to follow them, but, but we needed them anyway. So God, through a man named Abraham, and God through a man named Moses, and God through many other prophets, God gave humanity his law and continuing reminders of what people needed to do. But people, people kept breaking the rules. Now, God knew all this was going to happen. So even in those rule-specific days, what did he promise us? He promised us a Messiah. 
He promised us a Savior. And roughly 2,000 years ago, that Messiah came to earth, being Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, he didn't get rid of that law that God gave to his creation. He didn't come and say, guys, I, I got this new thing for you. He didn't say the law was invalid. Jesus came and he said, I have come to fulfill the law. Meaning that now, instead of trying to follow all these minute details in the law to be reconciled to God, now following the law means following. It means trusting in the fulfillment of the law. Trusting in Jesus. You see, under the law, every time someone makes a mistake, every time someone sins, they would have to atone for it. They would have to make a sacrifice or give an offering to God. But since Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, has come to fulfill the law, trusting in Jesus is now the atonement for sin. Trusting in Jesus gives us the forgiveness we need to get back on God's good side. Of course, just because I say this doesn't mean any of it's true. And this is where God the Holy Spirit will step in. If you're sitting here listening to this message, if you're listening online today or sometime in the future, if you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you don't even know what that phrase means to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you as I continue with this message, listen to that still, small voice inside of you. Listen to, feel that stirring that is happening inside. Is that feeling that you have down in your gut, is that feeling that you have in your heart, is it telling you that all of this is true? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word is Jesus. Jesus is God. And Jesus was there when we were created. Jesus walked the earth just like we do. And Jesus died so that our sins would be forgiven. Remember when I said how under the law, when someone made a mistake, they had to make up for it with a sacrifice or an offering? Well, when Jesus died on the cross, his death was the ultimate sacrifice for the mistakes we have made, for the sins that we have committed. But Jesus doesn't need to be crucified over and over and over again. One time, one sacrifice was enough to forgive all of the sins for eternity. If we believe in Jesus... And if we believe that that is why he came to earth. We also believe that Jesus didn't just die. He came back to life. And through Jesus, we too can overcome death. Now maybe as you listen to this, you're sitting there going, you know, I haven't done anything all that bad. I've never killed anyone. I've never stolen anything. I'm not that bad of a person. Do I really need this forgiveness that you're talking about? Well, yes, yes, you do. Paul tells us in Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all done something that is sinful, and we all need to be forgiven for it. The beautiful thing with this is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing we need to do first to receive forgiveness. You don't have to stop sinning first to receive forgiveness. I mean, we can't. That's not something we can do. And there is no cost for this salvation. Paul tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. A wage is something we earn. We earn death by the sin in our life, but a gift is free. It cannot be bought. It cannot be earned. It simply needs to be accepted. And we accept this gift by repenting of our sin. We turn to Jesus. Admit, yes, I'm a sinner. I have sin in my life. We turn away 
from those sinful aspects of our life. And we accept the forgiveness that the Lord offers to us. We must declare with our mouth, we must shout out, shout out loud that Jesus is Lord. We must believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead. Then we will be saved. It's through this process, through this repentance of our sin and acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, it's through this process that our old sinful self dies and we are born again in Christ Jesus. Do you believe this? Don't take my word for it. You don't have to believe this just because I say it. Listen to that stirring inside of you right now. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? That was a phrase when I first heard it, I didn't understand. Is God speaking to you? I didn't understand what that meant because to me speaking, hearing is always in my ears, but I've come to realize God doesn't necessarily speak in ears. He can. He can do whatever He wants. He's God. But most of the time for me, it's this feeling. And I think for most of us, it's this feeling that we get. I'm saying, you that Jesus, I'm saying to you that Jesus is Lord and the Holy Spirit is revealing to you now, yes, Jesus is Lord. It's, it's, it's happening in here. Is the Holy Spirit telling you this truth? If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to say today can be the day. Today can be the day that you go back to Jesus as well. If you've drifted away, you can say, man, this is, I, I need to go back. I need to say yes to Jesus again. In just a few moments, our praise team will sing our final song of the day as they start to come back forward. I'll be standing up here for prayer. Jennifer will also be up front. Mary will be in the back. And I'm, I've asked some of our youth leaders to stand up here as well, partly to be recognized as our youth leaders, but also to pray with you. I want to invite you during our final song to come forward and give your life to Jesus today if you have not done that. Either for the first time, to recommit, whatever it might be for you today. In Revelation, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Is he knocking at the door to your heart this morning? Let him in. Let him back in. Again, if you need prayer, you need to come forward this morning. Please do so as we sing our final song.